Welcome Movement Church. So glad you guys are with us this morning. If you wanna stand and sing, uh, we're just gonna worship our Lord and Savior. Child is this who laid to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping whom angels greet with anthem sweet while shepherds watch are keeping while I see in such mean estate where ox and lamb are feeding good christian feed for sinners here the silent word is pleading this this is christ the king whom shepherds guard and angels sing haste to bring him praise the babe the son of mary so bring him incense gold and myrrh compassing king to Oh, come. 
Good morning. Thank you for being with us at Movement Church this morning. My name is Don Hunter. I'm excited to welcome you this morning. Guys, we got six days until Christmas, which is nuts. I am a huge Christmas fanatic, but this is about the time where I, I have to start mourning it a little bit early. I'm like, I have to start grieving it. So I told my wife, I'm like, it's over. I cannot even enjoy it anymore. At our office, I usually, I'm the guy that wears the ugly Christmas sweater, the Santa hat. We had our Tuesday team meeting last week and I wore all black. It was the it was the quintessential Christmas team meeting. They're like, what are you doing? I'm like, it's done. I can't enjoy it anymore. I just mourn the idea that we go from such like this fun, joyful Midwestern culture. Come January 1, it's like we're all from Boston, man. We're a little mean. We don't even like each other. I'm just not, I'm not ready for it. But anyway, I hope you guys are enjoying the holiday season. Tis the season. Uh, we are here this morning because we are a movement of people finding our way back to God. And what you're seeing here today, Sundays are just a small sliver of that. We are a community of people who do life together. We come and worship together like this on Sunday mornings. We do Bible studies together. We do life together in community groups, serve one another, hold each other accountable, all to find our way back to God, experience his glory, experience his goodness. So thank you guys for being here. Sundays look just like this. We have a time of worship. We talk about what's happening in our community a little bit. We have a teaching from the Bible. We're going to be in week three, our final week of our Advent series before Christmas Eve. Uh, later this week, I guess that is. Um, and it's going to be a good time. We'll be together for about an hour. We'll have a, some uh, additional worship. We'll have a time of giving. And that's what our Sunday mornings look like. If you are new here, welcome. Thank you for being here. We love that you're here. We want to invite you into this community. We want to invite you into this lifestyle where we truly do life together, as I was talking about. would love for you to enter your information, uh, uh, hop on movementvip.com, fill out a little information about yourself. We want to meet you back there at the next, stable, next steps table uh, and hook you up with a t-shirt, answer any questions you have, tell you a little bit more about ourselves if you're interested. Thank you for being here. Um, with that, we're going to transition here for a second. I want to talk to you about what's happening in our community. We are a church plant. If you guys didn't know that, we have been planted by uh, another church. Uh, and we, in our DNA is this church planting idea. We want to plant churches that plant other churches. I believe our lead pastor, Mark Artrip's vision is to plant 25 churches who also plant 25 churches, which is just a phenomenal mission. So we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be who we are if we didn't have the support of other ministries, people that supported us. And we wanna have that same 
mission. So what you're seeing behind me is a church plant that we are working on in Haiti. Uh, you guys have helped build, buy land, build a building, and help support ministry in Lafito, Haiti. We've had an opportunity to uh, build this building that you're seeing here. Uh, it sounds like just in the last week or so, we were able to put a roof on that building, which is pretty awesome. I was talking to some of our, yeah, it's a huge deal, a huge deal which is pretty cool. You'll see here, these guys are meeting on the side because that's where the shade is, right? It's so hot in Haiti. They got to find and hug up against the side because of uh, the sunshine and the heat that comes from that. So be able to put a, a roof on that is amazing. So we're just hoping that that is an opportunity to launch that ministry, bring hope and bring life and bring freedom to the people of Haiti. What a wonderful thing. Uh, in addition to our Haiti ministry, we also have Contrast Church. So at, our first church plant was Contr or, uh, um, Three Creeks Church in Gehanna in 2018. We have Lef our church in Lafito, and now we're talking about Contrast Church that started in 2020. They just had their launch in their new building last week. Our lead pastor, Mark Artrip, was able to go be a part of that. Joel Trainer of Three Creeks Church who helped us plant that was there as well. And it's just amazing to see. That's right, 175 people came for two services uh, to worship in Grandview, and we are super stoked. But guys, this is what we are doing here. We wanna introduce the gospel, the good news, all throughout the city of Columbus, our country, and the world, which is amazing. And you guys are doing that. So we just wanna celebrate you, celebrate the ministry that's happened, and say, let's go, let's keep doing this. So thank you guys for being a part of this. Thank you for introducing people to the love of Christ. All right, with that, let's keep with our message. Uh, thank you guys for being here this morning. It's, uh, it's good to be back. Don mentioned that uh, last week I had a chance to, uh, to go to Contrast Church and be a part of their launch. Uh, and I was just like an awkward soccer dad the whole day there. I was just like smiling and taking pictures that no one thought should be a picture. But I was just like, say cheese. And everybody's like, who is this guy? And why is he here? And I was just like, I'm your spiritual grandpa. And just, it was really awkward. So, uh, but it was, it was cool to, uh, to, to just be there and, and see something that uh, God has put on our heart something that we have prayed about, something that we wanted to see brought to fruition, and just to see that church launch uh, and, and see people from the neighborhood that are like, hey, we've been, we've saw the sign, we've been watching this, we need a church in this area, and to just come in the doors and uh, be able to meet people that we have sent from this church. So that was uh, just a, a really great thing to, uh, to be a part of. Um, I wanted to uh, give you some other uh, updates. Some of you know uh, that, that this last couple weeks has been uh, kind of crazy. Uh, Jen Hill, our former kids director, uh, passed away, and so we had her uh, celebration of life uh, on Friday, and so I, I wasn't able to, uh, to be here last week. I know that Trig uh, kind of talked us through that moment, walked us through, but I just wanted to say uh, on my behalf, I, I greatly appreciate so many people uh, who have been able uh, to, to honor her memory, uh, just to, to check in on even me and my family, but to love uh, Phil and, and Jen's kids um, and just take care of them so well. Uh, it's been so neat. People that are their friends, people that don't know Jesus have, have come and they've said, wow, I've never seen uh, people come around a family so well. Uh, and so I think you are representing the body of Christ well. And uh, that's something that, that we're going to continue to do uh, for that family. So I just wanted you to hear thank you from me uh, because it's been humbling and, and fun to watch. Uh, and, and Jen would be proud to, to call this, this family home. So uh, one other thing I wanted to uh, let you know, many of you know Blake Cruz, who is our family ministries director, works with Movement Kids, Movement Students. Uh, he got married last night, so you will not be seeing him for a while. So next time you see Blake, you can just uh, ask him how the Caribbean was, because that's where he is right now, and we all resent him for that, all right? So, uh, but he, he and Brooke got married. That was a cool party, a fun celebration. And so there's, uh, there's every possible uh, family life update I can think of for Movement Church. So uh, let, me, uh, let me pray for us as we get going here and just ask God to be with us this morning and open our eyes and our hearts and our ears. So let me, let me pray for us. God, thank you so much for bringing us together. Thank you uh, for the ways that you have built this community and the ways that we can love each other. And uh, God, we just ask now as we open your word that you will, uh, Lord, just, just meet us here. We know that where two or three are gathered, uh, you are with us. And God, we trust that in scripture. And so we ask that you will uh, be with us. You will grow us this morning. You will convict us and help us to understand more and more what it means to follow you. It's in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. 
Well, every Christmas, you probably get asked the same question, or maybe you're the one that's, that's asking it now. It's some version of, of this where people say, hey, what do you want for Christmas? And it's probably a more uh, exciting question when you're younger. My mother-in-law asked me the other day, and she was not happy with my answer. I told her I wanted a, a mountable garage vacuum, a wall-mounting garage vacuum. And she was like, you used to be cool when I met you. And I was like, yeah, I know. Now I just want a garage vacuum, right? And she's like, what else? What else? Is there anything else you'd want? And I was like, I need some new muck boots. And she was like, that's even worse than a vacuum. And I was like, well, that's, that's where I'm at in life. So uh, maybe, maybe you're the person that asks what someone wants for Christmas. Maybe you're the person that's trying to get that out of your kids or your grandkids. Uh, I actually remember most of the Christmases in my life based on like what I wanted that year. I was thinking back and I remember uh, when I was in first grade, I went through this phase where like track suits were becoming awesome and America was realizing that everything didn't have to be made of cotton and so like rayon was really cool. And I got one of those track suits, you know what I'm talking about, like you would like slide in gym class and you'd melt holes in the knees and stuff. Um, but I literally had one, it was like, it was like, this is when fluorescents were cool for the first time too. So this thing was like, it looked battery powered. It was fluorescent blue, like head to toe. And I would walk and it was just like, psh, 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 psh. and I, I remember going back to school in January and just thinking like I owned Sterling Elementary School. Like I was just like, <laughs> I was just like, all right, this is my rayon suit and you guys live in my kingdom. And uh, it turns out it wasn't that cool in hindsight, but uh, third grade was the year uh, that I decided I was past track suits. Uh, I moved on to cardigans and matching turtlenecks, if anyone remembers that phase of the 90s. Um, and again, I own Sterling Elementary School, thanks for asking. Um, I, would wear, I would wear cardigans and turtlenecks with sweatpants and that, I don't know why I did that, but I, I thought it was like awesome. And uh, it wasn't in hindsight. My mom will show me pictures and she's like, you wore turtlenecks with sweatpants. And I'm like, let's not speak of this, mother. So uh, fifth grade was the year that I was way past all of those things. I decided I was more mature, and so I wanted to get an aquarium and start raising fish. And so uh, my parents bought me all these accessories, and I, I bought like a shark, a mini shark, and these different fish, and the shark ate all the other fish, and it went, it went terrible. Um, but I would, I would fall asleep every night with the light on in my room, just watching those fish and thinking that I was like uh, Steve Irwin or like some nature person or something. It was, it was great. So um, the reason I, I bring that up I think for most of us, uh, we're, like I said, we're always thinking like, okay, what am I going to get this person or what are they going to get me? And we think of uh, Christmas in terms of, of presents a lot of times. And then as we get older, we think like, oh, that's for kids. That's not for me. Uh, and I was thinking this week, the things that I'm excited for, for Christmas and Christmas break, and they're kind of like the adult version of presents, right? Like I'm still excited to wear sweatpants. I'm not going to do it with a turtleneck, but I'm going to wear sweatpants like eight days in a row. That's one of my goals. The other one, you know, we all think like, okay, I finally don't have to go to work. And, and I realize that, that we're still looking at things that, that get us excited about Christmas. It might not be presents. It might not be even giving presents. It might not be getting your credit card bill, but we're like, all right, I'm going to finally get a break. I'm going to get some time off. And we have even this adult version of, of what I would say is, is kind of a distraction. There are kid distractions to Christmas and there are adult distractions to, to Christmas. And yet all of those things kind of take our attention and take our, our minds and our eyes off of what really matters. And so the reason that we're doing a, a Christmas series this year and really every year is because often in life, especially in the adult American life, we take our eyes off of Jesus. We take our eyes off of what he's done for us. And, and so we're in this series right now uh, called Bridge Builder. And I want to just give you a, a vision for this. If you haven't been here, if you haven't caught this, we've said that the Christmas story reminds us that the birth of Jesus brings the hope of the gospel in God's plan. And so no matter who you are, no matter where you are, no matter what titles the world has tried to put on you or, or to box you in, no matter where you find yourself, Jesus is pursuing you. And Jesus pursues each one of us and overcomes the titles and limits that are placed on us. And so this series that we're calling Bridge Builder reminds us that Jesus builds a bridge so we can know God. And that same love, once it begins to take root in our lives and in our hearts, sends us out to be bridge builders to the world around us with the gospel. And so a couple of weeks ago, uh, we highlighted the Christmas story. We highlighted the shepherds specifically in that story. We talked about how unexpected that was. If you were going to announce the birth of the Messiah, the birth of the Savior of the world, you wouldn't say, hey, who are the outcasts of society? Let's appear to them first. And yet that's exactly what happened when the angels appeared to the shepherds. We said the shepherds remind us that the announcement of Jesus is for all people. 
Last week, Trig talked about Mary and even her cousin Elizabeth and two people that were so intricate in the birth of Jesus, the story of Jesus coming to this world, but they would have been considered pretty obscure. They wouldn't have been people that you would have said like, hey, these are, these are younger women. Let's highlight their role in the Christmas story. Again, they would have been considered young and uneducated. And we said that God uses humble people in humble places to serve the humble king. And so this morning, we want to continue going through the Christmas story. We want to highlight exactly what, what started and what continues through the birth of Jesus. We want to highlight God's global mission. And so if you've got a, a Bible, I'd love for you to turn to Matthew chapter 2, verses uh, 1. We're going to be in 1 through 12, just about. It's on page 734. If you, uh, if you don't have a Bible, uh, there's probably one under your chair or around you somewhere there. You can find one. And if you don't have a copy of the Bible, if you don't have one that you think is easily readable, you are, you are invited to take that Bible home with you today. That is our gift to you. And we would love for you to have a copy of God's word that you can read and you can study and you can get to know him better. But we're going to be in Matthew chapter two, starting in verse one. This is one of the gospel accounts of the Christmas story. Matthew chapter two, verse one. It's talking uh, even, uh, even after uh, Jesus was born. It gives us this. Chapter two, verse one says this, Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from Eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, where is the newborn King of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose and we've come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem in Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah. For a ruler will come from you, who will be the shepherd for my people, Israel. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. Then he told them, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. After this interview, the wise men went their way, and the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. When it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. Well, this is uh, after the initial birth of Jesus that, that we've talked about. This is after maybe the classic part of the Christmas story that you would see taking place uh, before this. Verse one there says, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. It says it was during the reign of King Herod. And it even mentions these wise men from Eastern lands who arrive and ask, where is the newborn King of the Jews? They saw his star, a star as it rose in the sky, and they'd been following that. They'd come to worship him. That star had guided them and had been their sign, had been part of their calling. And you're probably wondering, well, who are these wise men? Who are these? I always love when people call them magi. It sounds so official, right? You always hear that said, and you're like, all right, but what's, what's exactly their role? Because we see them in the nativity. We see they play a significant part. And yet this intro is just a couple sentences. So let me give you some background uh, on these guys. As I mentioned, it had been a while since the birth of Jesus, and, and these guys show up, and we don't actually really know how many there were or where they're from, but they brought three gifts, and so then we have this song, We Three Kings, and now we all just think there were three wise men, so let's just go with that for the sake of not confusing us American Christians, right? So we've got, we've got three of these guys, and tradition tells us that they were, they were men in high tradition. They were probably from uh, Parthia, which is near the ancient site of Babylon, and we knew that a star representing the Messiah had, had called them. But this, this text doesn't completely connect the, the dots after that. So it could be that these were uh, Jewish people who had remained in Babylon after the, the Jewish nation had been scattered. And maybe they still knew some tradition, some prophecy. And, and maybe they were looking for this. And so they, they came looking to find the Savior. It could be that they were Eastern astrologers and maybe as the Jews had been scattered and then come back to Israel, maybe some of the manuscripts had been left and they'd been reading prophecy and they were like, hey, this is, this is about to happen. And so maybe they were just some guys on the lookout for that. It could be that, that God came and spoke to them and gave them a direct message and said, hey, my son's been born. I want you to, I want you to come and visit him. You need to see this. It could be that they were from different lands. It could be that they were from the same place. We're not given a picture. And so we've kind of uh, put all those things together over the years. It could be a combination of all of them. But these guys show up 
and they are respected. They are accomplished. They are educated. They are regal. And one thing is for sure, we can't miss the fact that, that they represent that the world was finding out about hope. This was not just something that was going on in Jerusalem or something that was going on in Bethlehem, Judea. This was the world finding out about Jesus. This was the world being drawn near to the heart of Jesus. This was the world finding their savior. The bridge had been built. And there's some of the first people we see walking across that bridge, understanding the hope that would be found in Jesus. Starting with these men, the world would recognize the Messiah. The world would see the Messiah. The world could know the Messiah. These guys saw a star and they put their lives on hold. They came from a, a nearby land that would have been thousands of miles away. And so they, they went on this trek and they probably brought supplies. They probably had a caravan or an entourage. They probably had assistance. This wasn't just an afternoon hike. This was a big deal, but they were walking across that bridge. See, the arrival and the birth of Jesus was Jesus building a bridge to you and I, Jesus building a bridge for this world. And these wise men were beginning to live this mission that Jesus places on people's lives. And they were building this bridge. They were walking this bridge that many people after them could walk and could see. And this mission extended beyond their immediate context. It extended to the world. It extended to other countries and other kingdoms. And what we can see in what they're doing here, I'll explain this more, is that bridge building requires courage. I mean, these guys put their lives on hold. They went all in. They showed up at this neighboring land and they're like, hey, we're here to see this guy we don't really know. And they're asking around and walking in to someone like Herod's palace was not really something that uh, most people would want to do. And yet they were inspired. They were showing courage. Verse three says this. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? So you might be asking, why would Herod be so mad at these random guys? Well, let me give you some context and some background. We've already talked about Herod this holiday season, but he was not the rightful heir to the throne of David or the people of Israel. And so to be blunt, there were some overlapping nations and kingdoms here. The Jews hated this guy. They considered him a tyrant. They weren't, they weren't proud to serve him. They weren't in favor of him. And so if Jesus was the Messiah, if Jesus really was the heir, if Jesus was the king of the Jews, as was being said and prophesied, then that was going to be political trouble for Herod. He could see this beginning to attack his kingdom. And so just like in many movies where there's a villain and the villain is insecure and he's tried to overcome his insecurities, that's what you can see here with Herod. This guy is already getting a little insecure. He was ruthless. He had all these enemies and he was suspicious that someone was going to come in and overthrow his kingdom in some way. And so he didn't want the Jews, this religious people to even have a religious leader, let alone a political leader, or a kingdom leader, because all these things were a compromise to him. And so as these guys had made their way over from Babylon and wanted to talk to this new Jewish king, he was like, yeah, I don't like that. But he had to kind of trick them and not admit that he, he was mad that someone was going to swing the power away from him. And so I'm sure he got his advisors together. I'm sure he got people together and he said, Hey, uh, what, what's this? I'm hearing about this, uh, this Messiah, this King of the Jews is supposed to be born. What's going on? And all of his advisors would have certainly known these old Testament texts. They would have known Micah five, two, where we're, where it said the Messiah is going to come from Bethlehem. He will be born there. Those will be his people. He would have known the, the prophecies. If he didn't know, the, if he hadn't been paying attention, these, his advisors would have quickly told him, hey, yeah, they've kind of been talking about this for a long time. This is what we expected. This is what's known. This is actually why even when Jesus started his earthly public ministry years later, people were still talking, oh, maybe John the Baptist is the Messiah, because a lot of people knew this in culture. They knew the Messiah was coming. They didn't know who and when and how, and they would get it mixed up and confused, but it was commonly known this is going to happen. Herod's counselors would have told him this. They would have believed in a literal fulfillment. So they would have passed these things on to him and they would have been waiting. Ironically, when Jesus came on the scene, these are all the same people that 
couldn't recognize that he was the Messiah, but they knew there was a Messiah coming. They expected a Messiah was coming. Verse seven says this, then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. Then he told them, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me this so that I can go and worship him too. After this interview, the men went their way and the star they'd seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasure chest and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. This original meeting of Herod and the wise men was probably one where he was trying to put on a smile, just like you'd expect in a Disney movie, and then you know he's going to pull off some double cross and and try to, try to hurt Jesus, try to kill Jesus. In fact, those were his exact plans. And so he said, oh, you guys know where the Messiah is. We'll go ahead and visit him and then feel free to come back and tell me where he is so I can worship him too. And then the camera would pan back and he's crossing his fingers behind his back, right? Because we know he has this other plan. But this interruption, Herod trying to, to foil God's plan didn't stop what God was doing. And so this star that had been guiding them as they'd walked thousands of miles over what scholars believe could have been months and even years, this star continued to guide them and took them right to the house where Jesus was. And by this time, we believe that Jesus was probably one or two years old when the wise men arrived. We believe that Mary and Joseph were married, living in a house and intending to stay in Bethlehem for a while. And the wise men show up and pull out these expensive gifts and begin to honor Jesus for who he is. These gifts are symbols of the identity of Jesus. These gifts are symbols of what his life on earth would go on to accomplish. Gold was a gift for royalty, and frankincense was a gift for deity, and myrrh was a spice used to anoint a body for burial. And we know that the magic of the, the arrival of Jesus is not just that he was born, but that he would go on to surrender his life, to give his life for you and I, to erase what we've done in our lives that are wrong, the things that separate us from God, he would give his life to pay the price for our sins so that we could walk across that bridge of his life and we could know God and we could rest in God and we could have hope in God. And so when we say the arrival of Jesus equals a thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices. We literally mean that we were separated from God, but because of the life of Jesus, a bridge has been built for you and I. And the wise men were walking that bridge. They were living that bridge. They were echoing that same bridge that the life of Jesus would go on to do. And I want you to know this bridge building requires humility. These wise men didn't just come to say, hey, there's Jesus. That's pretty cool. They didn't just come to network and say, hey, we think you're a leader and we want to make sure we've got a military alliance here because you're going to be great someday. Now, these verses say they were acknowledging a future king. These verses say that they bowed down and they worshiped him. They may have not had theological textbooks. They not have, may not have understood everything that we know, but they knew plain and simple that God had told them, this is the Messiah. And they bowed down and worshiped him and surrendered to him. Verse 12 says this, when it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. I'm really glad they didn't go back to Herod because Herod had bad things in mind. In fact, these verses, this passage goes on to say that Herod put to death all of the, the young boys within a certain age because he was trying to make sure that he could eliminate this Messiah. He was doing everything he could to take this out of his path so that he could still be the one in charge. Verse 13 says this, after the wise men were gone and the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, get up, flee to Egypt with the child and his mother. The angel said, stay there until I tell you to return because Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. That night, Joseph left for Egypt with the child and Mary, his mother, and they stayed there until Herod's death. They stayed there until Herod died. And eventually, a few years later, they would come back and live in a town called Nazareth. Verse 23 says, it says this fulfilled what the prophets had said. He will be called a Nazarene. There are so many things that we can catch in this part of this story. I love that it's explaining that the arrival of Jesus brings hope, but the arrival of Jesus makes this a worldwide mission that God was unfolding. This was not just happening in one town or one village or one country or one region. God was beginning to build bridges through the life of Jesus and through the way that he would guide Jesus and Mary and Joseph 
to all different parts of the world and all different parts of this story. The story shows us that Jesus came for the whole world, not just one group of people, not just one time, not just one context. Jesus came to give hope for the world and give his life for the world. And in turn, when we understand that he gave his life for us, we can live our lives for him. We can live that hope for the world. Finding Jesus might mean that your life goes in a different direction, one that's responsive or one that's lived out of obedience to what God is asking you to do. I love that even in these moments, Joseph, the earthly father of Jesus, his protector, his guardian, was, was having these dreams, and it's kind of like, hey, Joseph, you thought this was going to happen. Now this was going to happen. I mean, he got that original dream. Hey, your wife's a virgin, but guess what? God's giving her a child, and he'll be the savior of the world. That's a pretty normal dream, right? And then just as the dust settles, he's like, hey, I know you thought you were going to live here, but I need you to run and live in this other country for a few years because remember, your son's the savior of the world. Well, guess what? The king wants to kill him. And yet these dreams that he was being given were guiding him. Divine guidance comes from a prepared heart, and he knew who Jesus was. And so that guided Joseph's parenting, that guided his mission. It's the other thing about bridge building. We said that Jesus has built a bridge for you and I, and now we get to build bridges for people to know him. Bridge building is, is transformative. It is impossible to have your heart be surrendered to Jesus, to let him direct your heart, direct your emotions, direct your life and your actions and your income and your career and your family and your livelihood. It is impossible to surrender those things to Jesus and not be transformed. Jesus is in the business of changing lives and changing hearts. And it's our job to let him transform the world. It's our job to build bridges to the world. Here's our big idea for this morning. God's global mission demands we build bridges across the world. Sometimes in our unique suburban American life, there are, there are bridges that, that we don't naturally cross. Sometimes it's because we're too busy. Sometimes it's because we live in fear. Sometimes there are cultural barriers or sociological barriers. Sometimes some of us have built up certain ethnic barriers and there are things that, that we put in the way of taking hope to the world. When you look at the geography of this story today, I think it's very clear that the hope and the arrival of Jesus was for the whole world. Time and space and distance could not keep the hope of Jesus in one spot. God was making sure the world knew that hope was here in the form of Jesus. And so the gospel should compel us. The hope of Jesus should compel us to live with courage to live with humility and, and yet to live transformation for the people we come in contact with. And that's something that I, I hope you'll remember today as we look at this story. Some of us are going to be in some, some rooms this week that we're not excited to be in. Some of us love our Aunt Karen and some of us really don't like our Aunt Karen. Some of us don't like our Aunt Karen, but we can at least tolerate her kids Cody and Kristen, right? I think, I think Aunt Karen always names with the same sound there, right? So uh, you're going to be in rooms at, at work parties. You're going to be in rooms for family Christmas and family New Year's. And, and you're going to have the awkward one with the cousins you don't talk to. And you're going to have the one with your immediate family that you don't really talk to. There's going to be moments this week where you feel stretched thin. Maybe because you're an introvert. Maybe because you're an extrovert. And yet as followers of Jesus, we are called to live hope. The gospel and scripture is clear that Jesus built a bridge so that we could know hope. And I don't want to say that it's going to be easy this week. I don't want to say that it's going to be the most natural thing, but I hope you consider it your calling to be compelled by the gospel to live hope. That might mean just asking someone, Hey, how was your year? How's your family doing? How can I pray for you? It might mean giving a hug to someone that you don't want to give a hug to. But you and I are called to be bridge builders to the love of Jesus. We're called to live hope. And my hope is that our, our perspective this week is that we will be ready to love people like Christ would and to show them hope like Christ would as we're sent out this holiday season. Let's pray together. God, I thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for all the different ways the, the story of Jesus reminds us that we are sent 
and that we can live hope and represent hope and represent the gospel this holiday season. God, thank you for this worldwide perspective of the, the story of Jesus, that that story did not just happen in one village or one region or one country. God, you wanted hope to be known by the world, people who were thousands of miles away and had to journey for a long time. God, you have brought hope to the world in the form of your son, Jesus. Lord, we want to know Jesus. We want to rest in him. We want to be in relationship with him. And we want to be compelled by that love and that hope to love the world around us. God, my prayer is that everyone that calls Movement Church Home, everyone that's in this room today will be able to love the world around them this week, Lord. Even in situations that are tense, even in situations that are awkward, even in rooms that we may not want to be in or may not feel comfortable in, Lord, help us to be compelled by your love, to live hope, to live the fruit of the Spirit, to live the gospel, not for ourselves, not for our own acclaim, but because we love you. We want to glorify your name, God. It's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. Would you stand and worship with us?
<clears throat> when we worship, we're ascribing worth to a king. We're, we're responding to his transformative power in our lives. And then we're also right now gonna enter into a time of giving and we're doing the exact same thing. We're ascribing worth to our king, just like the wise men. We're saying, we don't owe you anything. Your gift of salvation is free, thank you, God. But because of that, I wanna respond to your goodness. I wanna give you the best of myself. Sometimes when I, I give, I think about that. I think about what it looks like to come to a throne and say, you are my king. I want you to have the best of me. And I, I love that idea. It's transformative for me. I think it's so special how I can have that intimacy with the Lord. And then when I see things like a roof going on a Haiti rooftop to experience the ownership of that, how good that is for my heart and for my soul, how much more satisfying and fulfilling that is in my life than the things that compete for my attention and my resources. So I just wanna encourage you to enter into that as well, to think about that. How am I responding? to God's goodness in my life? Have I been transformed? Do I wanna give him the best of myself? Uh, giving is just one way to do that. There's a couple different ways to give. There's gonna be some baskets that pass today. You can go online and give. But I just encourage you to live a life of generosity and see the transformation that comes from that. Let's continue singing together.
begin to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me then came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body began That's our service today. Hey, thank you so much for coming. Uh, real quick, I had one life pro tip for the guys today. It's, we were talking about the gifts of the Magi today. If you have not gotten frankincense oil and put it in your beard, uh, you haven't lived yet. So go get some jojoba oil, put some drops of frankincense in it, and it's gonna change your life. It's gonna be amazing. I gotta think Joseph did that when the wise men brought that for Jesus, um, but I haven't found that in the Bible yet. I want you guys to have a great week. Come back here this Friday, Christmas Eve services. We have them at four o'clock and 5.30. It's gonna be awesome. It's one of our family's favorite traditions to sing Silent Night by Candlelight. It's awesome. Invite your family and friends. We think they have somewhere to go. They don't. So tell them to come here, text them, and we'll see you guys Friday. Have a great week.